This is a cautionary tale about what happens if you don't make clear goals. For the first time in my career, I am slowly, but consistently, losing more followers than I am gaining. This is a look at my calendar this time last year, and here's what it looks like today. When it comes to quantity of projects, if you compare this year to last year, or damn near any year in recent history, it's not looking up to par. There's no TV show, there's no book, not even a podcast. And this is my most successful year to date. This video right now that you're watching is sponsored by Squarespace. Now, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Now, whether you're just starting out or managing a growing business, I'm telling you right now, Squarespace is the easiest place to create a beautiful website. Engage with your audience. You can sell anything from products to time to content, all in one place, all on your own terms. Go to squarespace.com right now. Go play around, get your free trial, and when you're ready to launch, Go to squarespace.com slash shambooty to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Now, enjoy the video. Truth be told, I'm not a business or money girly, but one businessy acronym that has changed the way that I view and approach success is KPI. Key Performance Indicator, a quantifiable measure of performance over time for a specific objective. KPIs provide targets to shoot for, milestones to gauge progress, and insights that help people make better, more aligned decisions. Had I not created clear KPIs at the top of this year, I could have allowed any of those markers of performance to convince myself that right now, I'm a loser. Someone who is losing relevance, losing opportunities, and thus, potentially losing my livelihood. Or worse than that, I could have convinced myself that I need to course correct and abandon my current plan of action. And what I wanna tell all of you is, if you're playing soccer, you can't lose a basketball game. But you can lose your soccer game if you pick up that ball and try and shoot it through the net. You can't lose a game you're not playing, but you can lose your game trying to play by the rules and goals of somebody else's. And in order to identify what game you are playing and what you're playing for, first and foremost, you have to detach from all of the ists. Then you have to connect to the is. What is genuinely true for you? Now, this activity is so much easier said than done. And I was trying to reflect on how I came to my current KPIs and my process was twofold. One, I thought of a series of memories that were really special to me, that made my life worth living. And then I asked myself if my daily actions were moving me closer to or further away from making more memories just like that. Next, I asked myself what feeling would destroy the most marvelous experiences. If I got to the top of a mountain and had the most beautiful view in front of me, what feeling would exist inside of me that would prevent me from really getting to breathe in and experience that moment in all of its glory? And then I reverse engineered from there. Now, truth be told, you probably already tell from the basketball soccer analogy, I'm not an expert in this area, and I really do want for you to have actionable advice on how to identify your KPIs. So I'm going to tap in my sister, Lauren Morrison, who is an executive coach, to give better tips. What's going on everyone? I'm Lauren here, an executive entrepreneur coach, and today I'm gonna teach you, and also teach Shan, how to truly define KPIs that represent your personal vision of success instead of just meeting societal expectations. So first of all, let's clarify. KPIs are key performance indicators. They're not just business metrics, because in a world full of numbers, they allow you to cut through the noise and focus on the numbers that truly matter to you. The ones that show that you're on track to your personal vision of success. Now, you might be thinking, but Lauren, how do I know what my personal definition of success is? I've never really thought about it. Not an abnormal thing, but I'm gonna guide you through it step by step. Okay, you ready? There are four steps to this. Step one, reflect. Think back on the times in your life when you felt like truly in your skin, the times when you were firing on all cylinders. What were you doing? How did you feel? Was it a moment of professional triumph, a fulfilling personal project, or maybe even time spent with family that left you feeling really content and just like, I want more of this. Identify these moments because they are the clues to what lights you up. Then step number two, define your big, hairy, audacious goal, which is your bag. And when I say audacious, I mean that writing it down makes you feel a sense of like, who do I think I am to dot, dot, dot. 
If failure was no option, what would your life look like to embody more of those moments from step one? This goal should both thrill and terrify you because it's your North Star guiding your journey. If you are feeling a bit queasy when you write it down, that's good. It means you're on the right track and you're operating audacious enough and you're thinking big enough. So now step three, we're gonna break down your bag. Ask yourself, what would need to be true a year from now in order for you to say that you are making tangible progress towards your goal? Now you need to be specific here because these are your objectives or your key milestones. So this is what Shan laid out in her video when you heard her say she wants to prioritize family life over work life, make maintenance money, or continue her education and start seeds for creating passive income, right? You remember that? Now I know that Shan referred to these as her KPIs and it's a common mistake, but we're not quite there yet. You see, it's still a bit too vague to measure, which means that she can easily continue to move the goalpost on herself or revert back to seeking validation in the numbers that don't align with her authentic success profile, such as number of followers or number of public opportunities. That's why we need to ground new numbers to keep our focus. So now we go to step four, which is to find your KPIs. These are measurable indicators that will show you whether you are approaching your bag effectively. If your goal is to improve family relationships, a KPI could be number of family activities that you've successfully planned and executed. If it's educational advancement, your KPI might be the number of courses completed or credits earned. If your objective includes generating passive income through investments, A KPI could be the number of new investments you want to make or say 20% growth in investment value over the next year. Is that making sense to us? Remember that the power of KPI lies its inability to be quantified. You should be able to say, clearly say, if the target was met or not. So it's not about setting vague intentions, but establishing clear measurable markers of your progress along the way. By following these steps, you're not only going to set goals that are aligned with your inner values, but also track your progress in a meaningful way. And if, and if this seems a bit overwhelming and you're looking to apply a structured approach to this process, you could check out my sticky note KPI method for a step-by-step visual and also an engaging way to keep your goals front and center all year long. Thank you so much to Lauren. And now I wanna talk about my KPIs for 2024. And this is a list that I wrote at the end of last year. For me, I would know that I was successful if I felt good about my family life, if I was making maintenance money, if I felt a connection to those who connect with my work, if I was pursuing a higher education or continuously educating and updating my skill set, if I was moving towards a life of passive income as opposed to input output which is how my entire business had been modeled up till this year. If I was building something of my own, whether that be intellectual property or physical property, if there was something from me that I could give to the people who connect with my work that I truly felt from start to finish was exactly as I envisioned and the experience that I wanted them to have. And lastly, if I had a brand that cohesively tied all of the things that matter together. If I had an easy way for people to understand the complexities of my livelihood and my life. Okay, let's go through these one by one, starting with family life, which was the most important thing to me. And here is why and how I made that KPI. Last year, we had four full-time employees, one of them who was a personal assistant, who would take the kids to daycare because Zaya, my youngest, had to go into daycare as young as five months old. And the only place that would take them that was up to our standards was about half an hour to 45 minutes away, which meant that pick up and drop off could take upwards of an hour to an hour and a half in each direction. So we had to have somebody who was doing that particular job, which also meant that that was time I was not getting with my kids. They would leave the house between 8.30 and 9 a.m. and come home between 5.30 and 6 p.m. every day. 
Now, because I had full-time employees who would be coming to the house, we also had a very stringent schedule of working from nine to five, Monday to Friday, and we would be working solely on work-based projects, things that were responding to incoming needs, um, things that had a deadline to them. I was also in school at this time, so what happened as a result of this very strict work schedule is that I had no overage time, which meant that during the weekends, I had to take one of the days to do schoolwork. And so one day, Jared and I were talking and he made a comment about daycare and he said, well, something to the extent of, we really need to prioritize what they say because in truth, they spend more time with the kids than we did. And I said, no, they don't. And Jared said, yeah, they do. And we started to really talk about it in dismantle and break down the hours and the truth was, Yes, the other people were spending more time raising my kids than I was. Now, in full disclosure, I had kids wanting to be a working mom. I had kids with full knowledge that I wanted to work them into my lifestyle um, and that I was capable of doing that because of the financial freedom that I achieved by the time that I got kids. But I also didn't want that. And I really didn't enjoy that realization and that feeling I also further didn't enjoy the fact that when I was with my kids because we were on such tight deadlines and I did always have overage work that my brain would be thinking of work still, one, or two, would be trying to steal away moments to complete last minute projects or tie up loose ends. So I made it my main mission last year to create a lifestyle where family life was the bulk of my time. I still wanted to work. I still wanted to balance out with other activities. I still wanted to do school. But overall, accumulatively, those things could not amass to more hours than I spent with my family. I always like get teary with these videos, it's just so lame. Um, just goes to show why I really need to go back to talk therapy. But yeah, I did that. I just made a really, I made bold moves. I made risky moves, um, moves that made some people upset because when people are expecting you to work a lot. I made layoffs, you know. I did all of these things to try to restructure my life where I could look you in the eye or in the camera and tell you that my family life is the most important thing to me. And that isn't something that I can just say, it's something that I can genuinely show. If you look at my calendar, if you look at my way of life, and when I am with my family, I am with my family. And it's the best. KPI number two was to make maintenance money, baby. Um, I love money. I grew up in a family that hated money. My dad in particular has very negative views on money. So we just grew up with the rhetoric that rich people are unhappy, that famous people are miserable and need drugs to cope with life. And there was like a constant, um, in my house, for example, we were told that People who are happy make between 80 to 100,000 a year. Anything less than that, you might struggle to balance your basic needs. Anything more than that, money becomes the big stressor of your life and it actually takes away more than it gives. So even when I moved to Los Angeles, I would actively say things like, I don't want to be rich, I don't want to be wealthy. And then I started to make a little money in 2017 and I realized money's fantastic. Now, money is not, the story. It's the punctuation in the story, okay? So if you don't already have a good family life, if you don't like yourself, if you don't have a connection with uh, a, a higher power, if you don't have respect for fellow men, it's just all the things, it's not going to be able to rewrite that for you. But if you do, it can bold that. If you don't, it can actually bold that. So it's just the punctuation and it just I like an exclamation point, y'all. <laughs> it's wonderful to not worry about money. It's incredible to have opportunities to access really great, cool, interesting things in life, to taste new foods, to stay at really great places, to live in a very beautiful home. So what I thought about this year, scaling back so that I could spend more time with family, I didn't want to do so to the extent that we lost out on 
the way of life that we've become accustomed to that we really enjoy. So I really wanted to figure out how I could do both. I actually sat down the top of the year and really wrote out like how can I make X amount of dollars based on you know what our monthly budget is. And I just want to say this is not a moral the story thing. This is just a moment for me to feel really good about that. In order to make this decision, I asked myself, what am, I, what am I unquestionably very, very good at? And what do I know how to do better than anybody else? A lot of the things I'm trying to do this year are me entering into ball games um, or lanes, the business side, for example, that I traditionally am not very good at, that I am a little bit scared of, that there's a big learning curve. So while I'm undergoing this learning curve phase, in my maintenance phase, what do I do that's just my bread and butter that I know inside and out? And that is licensing out my expertise and my platform. I am really good at talking about sex, love, and relationships, and there are companies who are willing to hire me to do so. I don't have to really extend myself. I don't, in many cases, have to learn something new. Going off of the existing work that I have done, I can apply that to that business, and there can be an exchange that's met there. In addition, I've spent a lot of time and years cultivating an audience who is very engaged in intimacy. There are a lot of brands and businesses who are interested in getting in touch with that audience. I can provide that pathway. And if I'm very honest, I'm really good at marketing. It's one of the talents that myself and Jared uh, used to dread really about our business, of feeling like, are, are we just an ad agency? And maybe in some cases, yeah. And we're actually really, really good at making sponsored content. So that's just what I've been doing this year to maintain. And through leaning into what I'm good at, taking on less projects, but being really mindful about what I do take on, I actually think I'm projected to make more money, if not damn near double the money that I made last year. Kind of cool. Popping in real quick. I know I'm interrupting the video, but listen, I gotta give a shout out to the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. And let me show you these little tools that they got. Check this out. Squarespace's Blueprint AI and CEO tools start a completely personalized website with a new guided design system. Easily launch your website and get discovered fast with integrity, flexible payments. Make checkout seamless for your customers with simple but powerful payment tools. Nobody likes to stumble around at checkout, so make it easy with Squarespace. The Fluid Engine. With Fluid Engine, the next generation website editor from Squarespace, it has never been easier for anyone to unlock unbreakable creativity. So I'm telling you right now, go check out squarespace.com, go play around, make your dream website for free with their free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash shambooty to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Again, that is squarespace.com slash shambooty to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Now enjoy the rest of this video. Why'd I sound like rabbit? Why'd I sound like the rabbit right there? Throw the rest of this video. Throw the rest of this video. Just enjoy the video. KPI number three, I desperately needed to connect with people who connected to my work. Again, when I was thinking about how I made these KPIs, I was saying this to Jared and having this conversation that a lot of my KPIs came out of a place of negativity. Um, and so that's not really the best advice to pass on. But how I created this KPI was after accomplishing certain capitalistic things, having a viral moment that a billion people engaged with, being on a TV show that was number one on Netflix. Um, I didn't feel, you feel really good for a couple of days. It gives you a really nice hit of dopamine. It's very exciting. You check your phone, it's really cool. And then it fades and then there's, there's nothing left but to chase that next feeling. And um, people just become numbers to you. And you don't actually know if your work is positive or impactful or valuable. You just know that it's commodifiable. And that's a dangerous place to get into. I think a lot of people on YouTube get into that space where it's not necessarily that their work is actually helping, but it is performing. And you lose sight of that line if you're not really engaged and connected to people. So giving back was something that was very, very important to me. Um, but again, I knew that I didn't want to take on more projects, to take away from that big priority of family life um, and of maintaining money. You know, these priorities genuinely are in order of importance to me. So 
what I did is I started to think of who does this really well and how can I take a little bit of my time and give back to this other person in a measurable way, whether that be money or exchange of services, so that they can do the part that I don't wanna do. Long story short, mentorship is something that kept coming up for me. As somebody who feels like a path paver in my industry, I feel like I have done something incredible with my life. And I did it without bricks laid out in front of me. I did it without a shovel to lay down the bricks. I did it without a pile of bricks beside of me. That is to say that those there's other people haven't done it in the past, but I wasn't aware of those people. And I know when I started, I really built this from the ground up and I love what I've built. I'm really, really proud of my career, where I'm at, what I know, um, and who I know. I'm just, I'm very, very proud. So mentorship is very important to me because I'm like, how do I give the tools that I have? How do I provide the bricks for other people? How do I show them the path? Um, how do I make it a little bit easier to get to where I am and hopefully, of course hopefully, above where I am? But furthermore to that, the whole point of KPIs, get to where they want to go, which can be somewhere completely, totally different. So I partnered with the National Coalition for Sexual Health, and this is actually an ongoing program if anybody here is unaware of this, but I do mentorship series. I do them in cohorts, we've, only, we've completed one so far, where I take 10 people who have really gone far in the intimacy education space and just need a little bit more guidance, and we worked with them over a five week span of time, or five session span of time, not week, it was probably over six months. Uh, we recently did a capstone where we did all access, so there was over 200 people who came to this. From there, the National Coalition will select another small group of people who will work with more intimately, and the cycle will repeat. I've brought on experts you know, to these to give more materials, to give back. I've brought on my manager. I can now bring job opportunities to this group. It's just been so rewarding to me. Um, to hear the success stories of people who have just gotten a little bit further faster and oftentimes not because of me in particular but even the opportunity to be in community with other people it's just been really really rewarding the second thing i really wanted to do and again if you're connected on my instagram you might be aware of this but i talked about um, wanting to get to know people's actual individual stories changing the way that i saw success from how many followers am i accumulating to who are these people because a hundred people who I would never want to spend five minutes at a bus stop with is not as important to me as one person who I really admire, um, whom, whose story I really want to hear. And I won't know the difference between those 100 and that one unless I have a way of listening to people and connecting with them. So everything that I have been doing in my business structure-wise has been figuring out how do I go deeper and more meaningful with individuals? So if five people found out about Shan Boudram today and they are also connected to intimacy and learning about it and talking about it, um, I have a way of getting to know those five people and then asking them and inviting them into a deeper connection. And then from there, we can figure out where this is gonna go. I just didn't even have that infrastructure set up before and I aggressively sought to figure this out. Another reason why I'm so passionate about mentorship I actually hired a consulting company for $25,000 um, to basically tell me how do I even go about doing this in the most impactful, elevated way to reflect where I feel I'm at in my career and how I want to position myself. And then from there, they pointed me in the direction of a team who can help me build this, which is another exuberant amount of money that I'm honestly so, so happy to pay, um, and which is really, 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 really great again as to why I'm happy. I made more than just maintenance money this way. I made investment money. KPI number four, I had to be continuing my education. We're late enough in the video that I could be really, really honest and a little bold in saying, I am sickened by the stories of experts and pundits and gurus who have lied and faked and plagiarized their way to the top. Especially in light of the fact that once you get to the top, there is no saying that you can't go back and strengthen up your foundation at that point. If there was extenuating circumstances, financial barriers, I completely attest that, I understand that. When I was applying for ASECT, which is the biggest 
most prestigious board for sexual educators and therapists in America. I applied to them in 2014. At the time, I did not have a bachelor's degree. And they said, that's it, you can't apply. I pointed to all the work that I had done, all the impact that I had had, the book that I had written, and none of that mattered to them. And I was frustrated because the reason why I didn't have a university education is that originally I got a full scholarship to Baltimore to run track. After a year, my scholarship was reduced because of my athletic performance. I couldn't afford to go back to school and it was such short notice that I ended up needing to just enroll in a college that was taking and that was a program that didn't offer a degree. Now I did graduate with a diploma and I did it in three years versus doing it in four years and I felt frustrated that because of this, you know, lack of privilege that I didn't have you know, a, a financial education that was paid for by my family or um, that I was being punished. So that to be said, I totally understand that the way that some people go about bolstering their educational foundation may not be traditional and some people may acquire fame and may acquire a community before they get that foundational knowledge underneath them. But once you have the resources, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to the community to get that foundational backing. To show that you give a shit about giving the best information possible, to show that you care about being plugged into academic and scientific communities and resources, to show that humility, to acknowledge the need to be a lifelong student because you are one right now. Um, that's been my story. So right now, I am reapplying to be an ASECT something that I've been working on since 2022, and now with my mentor, Bianca, um, who I've again had since 2022, I'm working towards it a lot more aggressively now. Since I finished my master's last year, I have more capacity to do that. I'm also currently pursuing my doctorate, and I'm doing it very slowly. I'm doing it one course at a time. It'll probably take me six years before I complete it, but the pride that I have in knowing that I prioritize this and the confidence I can have in looking all of you in the eye when we do get to be you know in the eye face to face and get that connection because I genuinely believe there will be more opportunities for us to have that in the future I can really really tell you that I know what the f I'm talking about I am also very proud to share that I am continuing my education both towards becoming ASEC certified and eventually towards becoming a clinical psychologist and I am able to do this within my 40 hour work week I don't need to take my weekends and very rarely do I need to take you know my evenings after the kids go to bed to finish up work because I have just cut back so much on the projects that I have that I have a day every single week week which I can dedicate towards school uh, it's been awesome I feel awesome KPI number five passive income in 2022 shared entertainment which is myself and George production company had our highest gross revenue to date it was astonishing to us how much we were able to make that year and the fact that I did it while being completely miserable, sick, and defeated most of the year was both inspiring and discouraging. So I started to really think about that because after that really successful year and putting myself through hell to make the number that we made, I also realized as of January 1st, 2023, if I didn't continue up that same pace, that same lifestyle, I would never see that number again. There was nothing that I had done that would carry over to the following year. Maybe residually so, but maybe like, you know, if we think about things like YouTube videos or, you know, old things that you've made, like residual income, we're probably looking at, I don't know, $12,000 a year, if that. So I had to really start to really reformat my brain on how do I make the work that I've made work for future me? So that there is a, a compounding of wealth, that there is accumulated wealth, um, that it's not just based on that input-output model. And if I'm having a year where I don't feel well, or some of my family doesn't feel well, and I'm not able to work as much, that I have created an infrastructure of business that can support me and support our lifestyle throughout. So passive income is something that we've been really hugely thinking about. I started the year off going on lunch meetings that I set myself. I'm so proud of myself for that. 
I reached out to companies that I really admired when I knew the founders and I just said, I'm trying to figure this part out. Can you teach me, one, how you did this, and two, are there opportunities for me to be involved in your business in a more meaningful way that would warrant equity? And equity is a word that I became obsessed with last year as I was obsessed with trying to really figure out this whole KPI things. Um, something that Naval Ravikant, um, someone who, a pundit I listened to quite a bit, talks about. And I'm really, really proud to say that today, we have equity in three major companies. Now, in terms of building our own thing, our own legacy that will create renewable income, that I'll talk about next, but that bit of passive income that isn't even at all based on anything that I do differently. Um, it's based on a belief and a trajectory that I've seen. It's based on numbers and charts and all those businessy things. Yeah, there's three different places where, where we are now part owners, let me correct myself right now, because there's actually four. And that's really, really cool. I think about that, I was talking to my sister last week and saying to her, one of my favorite things about my work week right now is my inbox. I love the conversations that I'm having. I love the messages that are incoming. They're very inspiring. They're very educational. They're scary at times. Um, but they're just moving in the right direction. And again, that's just based on that KPI of knowing that I wanted to set myself up for that. None of the things I'm talking about that are giving me a glow right now have paid for a grocery bill or a night out at McDonald's. Um, they're ideas, they're seeds that we're investing in for potential future payoff. But they're seeds that I'm really, really fully believe in, that I'm very excited about, that I know the owners, and it's just, yeah, it's thrilling. Okay, let's wrap this thing up. KPI number six and number seven, if I haven't lost track, are IP and brand. And in order to identify if I was creating genuine IP, I wanted to get to a place where I could tell you what I am making is from me to you. This is my taste that I'm living and dying by. This is how I interpret our relationship and what needs you have that I feel I can fulfill. And while I'm being advised by other people, ultimately it's from me to you. Currently, there's something I can totally say fits within that definition because there's other people's agenda when you've got a brand sponsorship or affiliation associated with it and or even things like my book which could appear to be IP because my name is on the cover. Truth of the matter is it's HarperCollins who published it and distributed it, um, who put the money up for it. So they get a heck of a lot of a say in terms of what is in it, how it looks, what it's called. I never did like that name. <laughs> Shade, no shade. So I set out this year to put myself on a path to have a home for IP. That's pretty much all I've gotten to so far. I haven't decided what it is I'm going to make. That survey that I did is a part of that, getting to know and understand us a lot more, like really connecting with this. This is and this are. Um, and so where that will net, I'm not sure. But in the meantime, I have been creating the brand home, the hub, that these things will live under. And I'm even saying that not totally confidently because I'm still in the process of making that. Um, as I mentioned, I hired a consulting team, nicely done, who let me tell the story of this because a really big way that I have been able to come to a clear idea of restructuring, and I'm so much clearer today than I was in January, and a heck of a lot clearer in January than I was in the summer of last year when I identified that like things just didn't feel good for me. But I obsessed over other people. That probably is like if you just, if you can't, we talk about this a lot in this video, but if you can't really figure out what are my KPIs, what should I be moving towards, what should I do first, what should I do next, just become a weird creep of someone that you look up to. That's, there's a better way of saying this, but I consumed so much Esther Perel content this past year she might be concerned if she went through my history. Like, what, are you planning on kidnapping me? Um, but no, I just am planning on copying you. <laughs> and copying isn't the right term. What it means is that I love what you have done and I want something similar. So let me really figure out what you did and how you did it and see how I can make it my own. 
And there are some like literal ways in which I have um, followed in her footsteps. I like read a bunch of articles on her. She mentioned in one of her articles, this consulting company that she utilized to get started. I went and hired that exact same consulting company. And I often use her work. I'm trying to describe to other people the brand that I'm trying to make. Not because I'm trying to make her brand, but the way that she has structured the work that she does, how clearly it's communicated, how beautifully it's showcased. Those are all things that are really, really important to me. Um, and that is a way that I am measuring my KPI. If I feel like I'm getting into the same realm of the feeling I get when I look at her work, do I get that when I'm looking at mine and the way that I'm structuring and building mine? That feels very vulnerable to share because I don't know, it just feels kind of creepy, but I wanted to share that in saying that one, I really hope for some of you, I can be that individual that you can pick apart, assess, dissect, consume, and then steal and improve, right? Take whatever it is that I'm giving you right now, make it you, make it better, make it bolder, make it bigger. Um, yeah, that would be a great honor to me. Anyhow, that's the end of this video. You already knew it was coming and you better have been thinking about it this whole time because I've been rambling on and the whole time you should have been thinking, hey, what are my KPIs? So that's my question to you all. In the comment section below, can you let me know three to five KPIs that you are working on or that you're establishing right now?